All right. Hi, welcome to another segment of Ask the Experts. I'm Eldina Chin, Family Life Educator with Moms for Life under Center for Fathering. With me today is Rini Gupta, Sleep Sense Certified Pediatric Sleep Consultant, founder of Yawn to Dawn Consulting. I love that. And most importantly, mother to a 10-month-old baby girl. Now, as a child sleep expert, Rini works with families with newborns, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers who are not sleeping well. She coaches families using the patented and world-renowned sleep sense method that has a 97% success, uh, percent success rate of helping children sleep 11 to 12 hours at night. Now that would be a great accomplishment for many parents. Thank you, Rini, for spending some time with me today and really giving parents out there a sense of hope. Right? right. Um, yeah. So let's jump right into this conversation. So there's this study that I read up on and it's reported in Sleep Foundation. And it says that after the baby's born, men lose an average of 13 minutes per night while women lose over an hour of sleep each night. And it goes on to say that parents sleep often does not return to pre-pregnancy levels until the oldest child is six years old. Now, this is a really frightening thought to any expectant parents or parents who are already <laughs> in it, right? Uh, sleep deprivation is really, really, um, it's, it's a real thing. It's a real struggle. So at this, at this point, I just, I'm just interested to know, uh, Rini, what has your experience been like? You have a 10-month-old girl. So how do, how do you relate to these findings? So my 10-month-old uh, was the textbook non-good sleeper. Like, you know, and... Um, she found it very difficult to settle down to sleep. She needed a lot of rocking. Um, you needed to do the pacifier. She needed to be fed to sleep. And she used to wake up three to five times a night. And that went on for five and a half months to the point that I had reached my breaking point. And that this is the statistic that you just stated, that the mothers do a lot more sleep than the fathers. That's not a statistic. That's a reality, um, <laughs> you know, that we face. And, um, you know, and I knew that I had to resolve it as, as fast as I could uh, mm -hmm. because I knew that I couldn't take any more of it. So you're right, parental sleep deprivation is very, very tough. And the thing is, for all the newborn, you know, ex expecting parents or parents who are newborn, what they will realize is that they can take some amount of sleep deprivation. You know, it's like the analogy of holding a glass of water. Like if mm -hmm. I hold it for a while, I will be fine. But the longer I hold it, even though the weight of the glass is not changing, it's going to hurt, mm -hmm. right? It just feels worse and worse and worse. And that is what sleep deprivation is like when you're sleep deprived for not just months, but years, right? So that is the real difficulty around sleep deprivation because the families that come to me, they are always coming with, we are at our wit's end. We can't do this anymore. You know, uh, I have mothers telling me, I want to give up. And not because there's anything else lacking, but because they're not getting adequate sleep. Mm -hmm. So getting good sleep is actually a very important part of parenting. Right? And this is just what we want to kind of like fight against. We want to kind of reduce parental sleep deprivation because it's preventing them from being the parents that they can be. You know, they can be a lot more involved and giving and energetic, but mm -hmm. because they don't get the rest they need, they're unable to do all of those things. Yes, I, I can totally relate, you know. And it's amazing how important sleep is for a lot of the things that we need um, just to survive day to day. You know, they talk about the zombie. Have you heard about the mombie? Um, yeah. <laughs> So, so yes and you know it's so great that you are you know really supporting moms and families and parents out there and you know telling them that um this does not have to be the case you do not have to wait six years to finally catch up on some sleep some much needed sleep right so i mean the whole point of so we have the whole point of sleep but then we're looking also into parenthood Right. Um, so at many new moms, right, we lean on the wisdom of other experienced moms. We don't just go on, you know, uh, a Google and do some uh, search, though there's loads of good resources out there. And, you know, by that uh, sort of point, you know, there's overload of resources. How reliable 
are some of the advice that's given, you know, even from experienced moms, right? Um, so here we are addressing some myths. I think uh-huh. this might be a little bit of a, a, a touchy topic for some, but I think we should address this, right? Because this could be in the way of us catching up on the sleep that we need. So one advice or a myth that we'd like to address really is um, the advice that we're often given, how we can help babies sleep through the night. So there's this one sort of advice that I, I've even heard for myself. Um, uh, keep the baby awake for longer during the day. And this is going to help your baby sleep through the night. Right. Do, do we want to do this one by one? There are two that we can talk about. So we start with this. Keep your baby awake for longer during the day. So, yes, please. Let's talk about that. That's actually my number one. Don't do this. Advice. <laughs> You know, um, so if, if you're trying to keep the baby awake the entire day, just in hope that they will sleep better at night because they'll be tired enough to do that, you are judging a baby by an adult standard. Mm-hmm. But a baby's sleep needs are much higher. They cannot take so much time awake. So when you keep them awake for the entire day, what you're ending up with is an overtired baby. Mm-hmm. And it's very counterintuitive that overtired babies are actually not just extremely tired, they actually find it harder to fall asleep Mm -hmm. because their little bodies are just flush with adrenaline and cortisol, which are our flight and, uh, you know, our fight and flight hormones. That's right. So these overtired babies, instead of falling asleep regularly, are actually going to be fighting sleep at the end of the night. And they're going to be getting up throughout the night as well because of all those cortisol in their body mm-hmm. right so do not do this babies need to nap regularly throughout the day it has to be according to their age younger babies can be sitting up to four to six naps in a day and when you become too older three naps two naps by the time the baby is about 18 months old they would be taking one nap a day but they need that sleep to get through their day and to ensure that they're not overtired by the end of the day. All right? So mom, definitely do not do this. Do not keep your baby awake throughout the day. Follow their age-appropriate wake windows and let them nap. All right. Okay. Now, point taken, all right? So babies, tired babies need to get their rest, really. Yeah. So here's another myth that we can address again. I've been told this, uh, you know, when I had my children, as so why I've got three of them, giving solids before bedtime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this will help babies sleep better through the night. Yes, Your that's thoughts. a big one as well. That's a big one. And it's not just solids. It's even the same advice is given for formula, mm-hmm. that gives solids before bedtime, gives formula before bedtime, and that will help them sleep through the night. Um, that is also a myth, okay? Mm-hmm. So um, I understand where this is coming from is that if you give more solids, um, definitely it will help to uh, fill up the calorie cup of the baby so that it will prevent any kind of hunger waitings at the night. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't have to be right before bedtime. Because if you do a big solid meal right before bedtime, you will end up with a baby who is probably going to be in discomfort. Because mm-hmm. think of it like what you would do for yourself. If you have a really, really heavy meal, would you straight away go to bed? Or would mm-hmm. you try to get some activity to feel a bit better and then go to bed? Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing for the baby. Um, please avoid giving solid right before bedtime. Now, coming to the part on formula, um, there is actually so many studies that have been done that giving formula versus breast milk uh, before bedtime actually leads to no significant differences between the amount of sleep the babies are getting. Mm. All right. And giving and when you give this advice to moms who want to exclusively breastfeed and you tell them no, you should be giving them formula before bedtime, mm-hmm. it puts undue pressure on the mom to do something that she doesn't really want to do because she exclusively wants to breastfeed. Mm-hmm. So let's not perpetuate this myth because it is just stressing up mom's <laughs> Right. And yes. and we don't need more stress. Best for the baby. Yes, absolutely. We don't need any more stress. <laughs> in your life. 
<laughs> and we're still trying to figure out all these things, right? And we're trying to sort of mother by intuition of what's best for our children sometimes as well. Um, and, you know, we know being inexperienced, uh, we do welcome advice in a way, um, but we need to be able to weigh out um, what is really beneficial and, you know, address any of these myths that uh, appear to have worked before, but they're not necessarily um, the correct way to get the, the right kind of sleep that you want, or it's not a healthy approach, perhaps, right? Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, I think these are the two common myths. I mean, you've experienced it, I've experienced it. So I, I imagine a lot of the mums out there are also hearing the same kind of things. And I think you've put some things to rest. And I know that a lot of it comes out of desperation um, and good intentions. But now that we know better, I think we can move forward and feel good about uh, the decisions we make as moms, right? So, so coming from, you know, uh, coming away from that angle of, you know, a, a mom trying to, or a parent trying to get their babies to sleep well, you know, listening to advice. So what are the reasons, some of the reasons that babies are actually not sleeping well? Yeah, that's a pretty good question because babies don't sleep well for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. but I will just break them down into two categories. All right. The one reason that we really can't do much about are developmental reasons. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's say when the baby is hitting their four month sleep regression, so that happens between the three and a half to four and a half month mark. Mm -hmm. um, it's like the babies, the way they organize their sleep cycles are changing. You know, the way they divide the light sleep and the deep sleep and the REM sleep, that is all undergoing some changes. So yes, at that time, the baby's sleep is bound to be a bit more disturbed. Mm -hmm. Additionally, every time a baby picks up a new skill, so let's say it could be rolling, crawling, sitting up, standing, talking, there's a new burst of words that comes out. All of these developmental changes actually do lead to sleep regression okay because the babies are just so excited to practice these skills even at night um that they just kind of like wake up in the middle of the night and start doing this so that <laughs> you know inevitably disrupts their sleep so i mean the very easy advice to fix that is that give them enough time to practice these skills during the day to prevent them waking up at night to do so so these are all developmental reasons mm -hmm. uh but because they are developmental, they only last for a short period of time. So like, you know, they learn a new skill, they master it. If they're a good sleeper, they will go back to being a good sleeper. Mm -hmm. The most common reason that we see for babies not sleeping well is actually sleep prop dependence. Okay, so let me explain that. A sleep prop is something that a baby needs to fall asleep. All right. And sleep prop, most of the time, happen to be the parent associated. So if the parent is involved in feeding the baby, rocking the baby, holding the baby, singing to the baby, um, all of these things, if they are being done by the parent and the baby associates them with sleep, then the baby is basically depending on the parent for sleep, right? Wow. <laughs> So now you imagine this scenario in which the baby, um, you know, he goes to sleep very nicely in his mom's arms. His mom is feeding him and then uh, rocking him. And then she puts him down on the cot. All right. And the baby is nice and fast asleep. But just like any human, um, they all come to a lighter stage of sleep after some time, right? Mm -hmm. So they come to a lighter stage of sleep, they wake up, they look around and they go like, hey, where am I? I was in my mom's arms. And now I'm in a crib. How mm -hmm. did that happen? And this startled them. Mm -hmm. And then they wake up crying that, where did you go? Where is that sleep prop that I need? Mm -hmm. right? So this is actually what causes babies to not sleep well. Because they're dependent on someone else mm -hmm. to fall asleep. And they still don't know how to fall asleep independently. Wow. Right? So this is what we try. Any baby who's a good sleeper essentially is an independent sleeper. Mm -hmm. That when they are awake uh, but tired, you just put them down in the crib and they roll over and fall asleep on their own. And babies <laughs> can do that. I know it sounds magical. I, know, right? I was just thinking, what? <laughs> that's exactly. a sight to see. But babies can do that. You know, um, I, I coach parents to teach their babies how to do that. Babies who can do that sleep so much better is because anytime they wake up and they look around, they're like, 
oh, I'm exactly where I was when I fell asleep. So mm. then we just go back into another sleep cycle and continue sleeping through the night. Right. I mean, when you're saying, you know, you wake up and you're in the exact same place where you you intended or you started, you know, heading to sleep, right? I, I, I'd imagine as an adult, you'll feel the same way if you were to wake up and you're in a totally different place. Totally, right? <laughs> Fantastic. All right. So two key reasons that you pointed out was uh, based on developmental stages, if they're picking up new skills as well. Um, so the idea that you, a parent might get the impression that, all right, they've got the sleeping pattern routine sorted and then suddenly they'd realize, nope. Right. So, so this is something that is um, expected to anticipate and it's normal. You know? Yeah, right. As, uh, for that window of, of, of all that um, new skill, right? And yeah. the other thing is that uh, a parent being a prop or a sleep prop. So yeah, I, I laugh at that because, you know, I think a lot of us have been uh, guilty of being a prop again, out of desperation, trying different things and, you know, seeing what works and, and realizing that it's not sustainable. And so, right. you know, great things to remind parents, especially and not to start, not to start doing this at all. It, it, I think it really depends. Like some parents, if they enjoy it, you know, and you know, and especially in the newborn phase, and you really want to do this for your baby, please go ahead and do that. Mm-hmm. But when you start finding it unsustainable, like the way you said it, that's when you know it's time to make a change. And mm-hmm. that's when you can start teaching more independence skills to your child. All right. Good advice. Yeah. I mean, that new baby smell is just really hard to just not cling on to. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. So, you know, let's give some advice for parents here, you know, some really um, tips that, you know, they could try out. So um, at what stage would it be considered reasonable to start sleep training? Mm-hmm. I think this is really important so that we can sort of be realistic in our expectations. All right. So one thing I'll tell you about sleep training is um, sleep training is not cried out, okay? So what I just said earlier, that babies need to learn um, how to have independent sleep skills, and you give them the room to learn that, that is sleep training, all right? Mm -hmm. So that is something that I really want to clarify because sleep training has a really bad reputation um, among parents, (laughs) all right? So there are a lot of different techniques involved. Some are really gentle that is suitable for, um, you know, younger babies. Mm -hmm. And then there are some that have more effective, like faster results because, you know, older babies would need that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now your question about at what age is it reasonable? Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you the magic number is four months. Uh, Below four months of age, we do not do any kind of formal sleep training Mm -hmm. because babies younger than that are genuinely not uh, capable of self-soothing right they are genuinely like they need your support um, to be able to soothe them into good sleep Mm -hmm. however after four months of age um, those same techniques like of soothing them and being very supportive can actually be more stimulating and prevent baby from falling asleep. So then you can bring in more formal sleep training techniques, such as gradual withdrawal, mm-hmm. um, in which you're still giving gentle support, but you're giving more room for them to master those sleep skills. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So it's three months of playing by ear, <laughs> or oh, about four months. The first four months. Yeah. Playing about by four ear. months of playing by ear. Yeah. 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 And sneaking in a bit of sleep here and there as well. That's correct. For four months of age, like there are gentler techniques such as the pick up, put down, such as the shush pad method. Um, if you consistently apply these very gentle uh, sleep training, sleep education methods, mm-hmm. um, those can really work to help babies build those independent sleep skills. But those are gentle techniques that work for babies four months and under. That's not considered sleep training. And mm-hmm. four months and above is when we do formal sleep training. All right. Okay. So yeah. So that's kind. Of, that kind of sets uh, realistic expectations for parents as well, right? Um, you know, at what sort of at which point it, it you know they could actually consider starting. Um, and so when you talk about sleep training, um, I'd imagine um, a huge part of it as well is not just the approach, but there's a routine that's involved, right, in the okay. whole approach. So 
So which, which means someone has to, to deliver this routine or, or stick to this routine. Um, yeah, so we're looking at parents here. So what makes sleep routines difficult for parents to implement and really what can help? I, I love this question because honestly, um, parents are very intimidated of routines. And the problem is because what they are trying to follow are schedules. What I am trying to suggest to them is to have a routine. Mm-hmm. That's different, right? A schedule is when you go online and then you go search for um, sample baby schedule for 10 months old. And then you will have something like wake up at 7, first nap 10 to 11.30, second nap 2.30 to 4, baby uh, bedtime at 7.30. And you're like, wait, my baby doesn't do that. I don't think my baby can do that. What if she only sleeps for one hour? What if she wants to sleep for two hours? Mm. And then they get caught up in these timings uh, because of which they just don't even try to have a flow to their baby's day because they get caught up in the schedule and the timing. Mm-hmm. As a sleep consultant, my job is to tell parents on how to establish their baby's routine. For example, I will always get them to follow a feed, play, sleep sequence. So when your baby wakes up, you feed the baby, you play with the baby, and then there is sleep time. Then you feed the baby, you play with the baby, and there is sleep time, right? So we are always keeping the feeding right after the sleep. Another thing I get them to follow are wake windows. That if your baby is, let's say, about four months old, they shouldn't be awake for more than two to two and a half hours. So you know that baby, whenever they woke up from their nap, two and a half hours later, I have to put them down for another nap, right? So where where I'm coming from is that I don't need parents to set up a rigid schedule for their baby. Mm -hmm. What they need to do is set up a predictable sequence of steps that the baby knows the day will follow. And Mm -hmm. that's how you set up a good routine for your child. Wow. Okay. Okay. So I, I feel that that should be printed on a onesie. Feed, feed me, feed play me, with me. me, put me to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's <Yeah>. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, as a as a, as as something that you know, as a parent, they're like, all right, checklist, checklist, checklist. That's my routine. It's doable. Three steps. I can do this. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. If that's the feeling I want parents to have from routine, they can do this. Mm-hmm. You know? Because babies love routines. Babies love having a predictable sequence of events in their day. And if you can give them that, you know, in every wake window, it's perfect for them. Wow, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Simple three step. Okay. We get it on a onesie. And then um, we'll help parents to remember. All right. Um, as a way to wrap up. Okay. So... Mm-hmm. We talk about sleep deprivation. We really don't have to wait. Now you're telling us there is hope, parents. You don't have to wait till your eldest is six years old. We can get that sleep that we are so deprived of. So as a couple, what, you know, uh, you know, within the family, what can couples do to improve the quality and the quantity of sleep for everyone in the family? Not just the baby, you know, that affects everyone else. That's true. When the baby's not sleeping well, nobody's sleeping well, and no one you know that. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's this age old quote, right? That it takes a village to raise a child. Mm-hmm. Um, given that nowadays all babies are coronials, uh, you know, <laughs> yes. we don't have a village. But at least if we have our partner or our parents or even a helper, mm-hmm. I really want to encourage mums to share the load of nighttime parenting. All right. So nighttime parenting is a very, um, it's like an unsung hero um, in the journey of parenting because it is tough and it is uh, working against your body clock in all ways, but you are still expected to be at your best mm-hmm. even at night, right? So um, I really want to encourage moms to share it because I have done it and I have heard other moms say it, and I'm sure you have heard it too, that Oh, my husband had gone, had gone back to work. And because he has to go to work in the morning, I take care of the baby at night by myself. Mm-hmm. And in the morning, the husband is all refreshed to head out to his office and work. And the mom is totally sleep deprived, you know, frustrated, tired. 
and she still has to take care of the baby the whole day, mm-hmm. right? So I want to remind all moms who are on maternity leave or stay-at-home moms that taking care of a baby is a full-time job too, mm-hmm. all right? It requires patience and focus. And for that, you need the rest too, okay? Mm-hmm. And the stakes are much higher. Let's be real. If your baby, the stakes are much, much higher. Yes. So for the night time, please split that with your partner or somebody who can help you so that at least you can get a four to six hour stretch at night um, to rejuvenate yourself. All mm-hmm. right. If you're only getting two to two hours of broken sleep, that is not restorative. That is not really good for your health. So get someone to share that load of the nighttime parenting. Mm-hmm. That's like my number one tip. If, um, like I tell this to couples, like, you know, you can't go without sharing the load, um, especially for young babies. Mm-hmm. Um, my second big tip is when it comes to nighttime parenting, we often find ourselves like using our phone um, at night. Let's say while you're breastfeeding, you're just getting a quick update from your phone. And, you know, while you're pumping at night, let's say, again, you're using the phone or you're watching TV or something just to entertain yourself. What happens is that because of all that blue light that you're getting, it is harder for you to fall back asleep. Mm -hmm. And I myself, I'm guilty of losing sleep unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. because Either I was like getting into a spiral of reading parenting blogs or just Instagram, you know, in the middle of the night. And my baby's sleeping and I could have been sleeping, but I didn't. Yeah. So let's avoid that completely. Yes. And the last and the most important one is incorporate teaching your baby independent sleep skills into your routine. All right. Um, if you just keep waiting for your baby to grow out of their sleep issues, there's a good chance that they might not. All mm. right. There's a good chance that you will be sleep your prior for months and years. So choose any form of sleep training it can be as gentle as you like but be consistent with it to see the improvement in your baby's sleep skills all right and that is really the one ultimate solution to help your baby sleep well because of which you will sleep well right mm-hmm. yep definitely. So that's the way to do it that's the ultimate goal for parents yes definitely i, I mean um, it's 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 really um, important when what you mentioned, you know, sharing the load, um, and I, I think I I think that fathers are becoming more involved um, in many parts of child care giving. I mean, as compared to the previous generation, right, uh, and all that. Um, and there's but there's always this question of whose shift it is, whose shift is it at night. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so there's all these things, and of course, um, you know, every uh, family ha- they have their own unique uh, circumstances and all that. And, and but really, the whole point of this is that everyone gets uh, good quality sleep, the right um, adequate adequate amount of sleep, and this is really the goal. And I mean, as couples, sharing the load will give them a higher chance of getting the sleep everyone needs. Right at home, and you know, um, as we try to as we wrap up, right. So there's this expression. I think we've heard about this. We put this expression: sleep like a baby. <laughs> sleep. But like the a baby. didn't have babies. <laughs> yes. So, so I'm not sure where this expression came from. I know it's it's. I don't know uh, who who came up with this, but sleep like a baby. But I would like to say that you know, with your expert knowledge and and the techniques that you have shared. Um, parents might finally get that good night's sleep they've been um, deprived of and really um, they have a fighting chance. I think that's what it is, right? So thank you so much again, Rini, for your time, for sharing your valuable tips so that parents can try them at home. Right? I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you.